I'm Tanya. Thanks for tuning in to Black Women Read, reviews of books, zines, and everything in between. So a few weeks ago, I attended a literary event featuring DeRay McKesson. DeRay is a self-described Black Lives Matters activist, former teacher, and once ran for mayor for the city of Baltimore. He was promoting his book, On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope. I tend to have mixed emotions about DeRay. I think he is someone who started off with good intentions and overall is still committed to his activism. However, it is obvious he has been seduced by the spotlight. He made a comment in his speech about activists being aware of taking up too much space as he takes up space. My friends also noticed his tendency to quote, use the work of black women intellectuals without giving proper credit. He also fussed about activists being social media hungry as he asked attendees to take a selfie for his Instagram. With that said, I must admit I found DeRay to be charming. I thought it was interesting why he continues to wear his blue vest. He stated the vest is the way for him to never forget the way he and other black protesters were treated during the Ferguson uprisings. The police threatening and harassing them bombing them with tear gas, and violently arresting them. He said his time in Ferguson propelled him to get more involved in the issues of police brutality in the prison industrial complex. While I have reservations about DeRay, I did agree with his sentiments regarding the prison industrial complex. The group Critical Resistance, co-founded by writer and prison abolitionist Angela Davis states, The prison industrial complex, PIC, is a term we use to describe the overlapping interests of government and industry that use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. Through its reach and impact, the PIC helps and maintains the authority of people who get their power through racial, economic, and other privileges. There are many ways this power is collected and maintained through the PIC, including creating mass media images that keep alive stereotypes of people of color, poor people, queer people, immigrants, youth, and other oppressed communities as criminal, delinquent, or deviant. This power is also maintained by earning huge profits for private companies that deal with prisons and police forces helping earn political gains for tough-on-crime politicians, increasing the influence of prison guard and police unions, and eliminating social and political dissent by oppressed communities that make demands for self-determination and reorganization of power in the U.S. DeRay made an excellent case for abolishing the prison industrial complex that includes an oppressive and exploitive bail system, the school-to-prison pipeline, and the over-criminalization of just living while black. The recent alarming story of a white woman calling the police on a nine-year-old child for accidentally brushing against her as he walked past and claiming sexual harassment is an example of this. The one thing I will say about DeRay is he treated the subject of police violence, the prison industrial complex, with the seriousness and dignity it deserves. This is in stark contrast to the troubling display of Kanye West's failed attempt to talk about prison reform with number 45. This embarrassing meeting showed the importance of supporting grassroots organizations doing this work, icons such as Angela Davis, or embracing new voices like Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow. A really good book I read several years ago is by Angela Davis. In the book, Why Prisons Are Obsolete, Davis highlights the idea that abolishing prisons is not impossible. It's no different than people believing slavery would never end or racial segregation. I decided to revisit the book after attending the lecture by DeRay. What I like about Why Prisons Are Obsolete is a short book and an easy read, no more than 128 pages. It's a great introduction to the topic of prison abolition. I'm going to read a little from the book. In Chapter 6, Abolitionist Alternatives, Angela Davis writes, 
Radical criminologists have long pointed out that the category lawbreakers is far greater than the category of individuals who are deemed criminals since, many point out, almost all of us have broken the law at one time or another. However, acknowledged disparities in the intensity of police surveillance, as indicated by the present-day currency of the term racial profiling, which ought to cover far more territory than driving while black or brown, account in part for racial and class-based disparities in arrest and imprisonment rates. Thus, if we're willing to take seriously the consequences of a racist and class-biased justice system, we will reach the conclusion that enormous numbers of people are in prison simply because they are, for example, Black, Chicano, Vietnamese, Native American, or poor, regardless of their ethnic background. They are sent to prison not so much because of the crimes they may have indeed committed, but largely because their communities have been criminalized. Thus, programs for decriminalization will not only have to address specific activities that have been criminalized, such as drug use and sex work, but also criminalize populations and communities. It is against the backdrop of these more broadly conceived abolitionist alternatives that it makes sense to take up the question of radical transformations within the existing justice system. Thus, aside from minimizing through various strategies the kinds of behaviors that would bring people into contact with the police and justice systems, there is the question of how to treat those who assault their rights and bodies of others. Many organizations and individuals, both in the United States and other countries, offer alternative modes of making justice. In limited instances, some governments have attempted to Im implement alternatives that range from conflict resolution to restorative or reparative justice. In Davis' book, she shows the urgency of moving beyond prison reform discussion and engaging in the radical movement of prison abolition. She argues that we are all vulnerable to being engulfed in the prison system. The prison industrial complex needs bodies to feed off of to thrive. No one is safe, and those who think they are are in for a rude awakening. I recommend Our Prisons Obsolete for those desiring to learn more about the prison industrial complex but not wanting a complicated read. I will also post in the description box other great books on this issue. Thank you for listening, and I will see you at the next video.